Tonight, I want to touch on Song of Songs. Okay? Written by King Solomon. Song of Songs. It's called Song of Songs. Shere Shirim. In, in Hebrew, Song of Songs. Why is it called Song of Songs? We know that Solomon was a prolific songwriter. The Bible says he wrote 1,005 songs. The Holy Spirit scanned through all the songs that he wrote and singled out one and call it the Song of Songs. And why, is it, why, why, does it, why does it call it Song of Songs? Some people say, well, the Song of Songs is about Israel. Some say it's about the church. All right, honestly, it's neither. It's about Him, the bridegroom, and His love. It is about the love of Christ, and that's why it's called the Song of Songs. Amen. There is King Solomon. He's in love with a Shulamite. She is the girlfriend, the lover, all right, of Solomon. Solomon here is a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Shulamite is a picture of the church. The church is typified in a, in a, in a feminine way. Feminine means you are the one receiving the love. But unfortunately, in fact, it was a German guy, a German scholar that came up with this. And it wasn't too long ago that he came up with this. And a lot of people believe there's a three-party thing. They believe there's a king who is in love with a country girl, the Shulamite. But then there's, the Shulamite is in love with a, a, a farmer boy. And the farmer boy is in love with her. Okay? Actually, that farm boy, that country boy is also Solomon. Solomon, all right, when he wooed that girl, he came not in the guise of a king, but in the guise of a country boy. That is the picture of the king of all kings. When he came to us, people, he came in a lowly way. Amen. Okay, moving right along, just jump to chapter 4. That's my teaching for today. The Lord is talking to the church again. He says, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. He's describing his bride. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. You have dove's eyes. So the veil is something that hides, okay? It's something that hides. In those days, please understand all this is Middle Eastern, the time of Solomon. But the Lord is able to look beyond his concern about your eyes. Amen? And what does he tell us? I can see the Holy Spirit dove in your eyes. Do you know beside the eagle, the dove, the bird, the dove, can see from very far. Of all the animals, God uses dove for the eyes. Amen? The reflection of the Holy Spirit. Dove is tender, gentle. It's a picture of gentleness, peaceful. The Lord is saying, I see gentleness in your eyes. Isn't it not beautiful? Amen, let's go on. Your hair is like a flock of goats. Now, this is not romantic for the modern man. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. We must go back to the, to the times that when they wrote this. Do you know that more goats, more prosperity? Like, like uh, 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 Abraham, Jacob, Isaac. You know, in those days, the Bible, when the Bible talks about their prosperity, it doesn't talk about banks, talk about the account, talk about they had plenty of flocks and goats and cattle. Remember that? So plenty of goats, flock of goats means plenty. Now in the natural, when you have plenty of hair, all right, for a lady, it looks good, isn't it? Going down from Mount Gilead. Do you know Mount Gilead? There is a verse that says, is there no balm in Gilead? Mount Gilead today is in Jordan area and they produce a balm. Even today, they say that there, there are, there are uh, you know, special balm that they produce, which is very good for the skin, for beauty and all that. And that's why even back in the Bible time, they say, is there no balm in Gilead? Who is the balm of Gilead? Jesus Christ. And notice, when you look at the, when you, many of you have been to Israel, you see the mountains, uh, 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 um, mountains sloping down. And you, many a times you will see Bedouin boys or shepherd boys bringing their flock of goats, usually uh, mixed up with uh, some, some sheep. But imagine all of them are goats, completely black, the whole place. So the Lord says, your hair is beautiful. Like a flock of Goats going down from Mount Gilead. And hair speaks of maturity. He sees you mature before you are mature. We don't do that with our children. We don't do that with our, our friends. All right? But many a times we see immaturity even when there's maturity. And that's why, you know, some teenagers say, you never believe the best of me. We've got to be careful how we, we see them. Because uh, sometimes when they are immature, we still, still see them as mature and trust them. They will rise up to that level. But when they, there are times they didn't do all right, something, but we accuse them of doing something, that can cause a hurt. And the Bible says, provoke not your children to wrath. It's better to lean on trusting them. 
And even when they fail, say, I, I, I trust you. You're a Jesus boy. You know, I love you. Amen. You're more mature than your friends. Well, when you are there tonight with all your friends, just remember, I see you more mature than them. I see you wiser than them. That's a better approach than saying, hey, you are be careful. Huh? I scared of you. You always, you know, don't do that. <laughs> Amen. He's teaching us how to love. So hair speaks of maturity. Baby girls, even when they are born, they have no hair. Right? Even when their hair is very thin, you know, soft hair. So when you grow, you have hair. All right? So your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep which have come up from the washing. Every one of them bears twins and none is barren among them. None is barren among them. So we know the teeth, upper teeth and lower teeth. They, they perfectly synchronized. They, they are perfectly uh, in shape. The spiritual is there. Again, the Lord sees you mature. You're able to masticate food. You don't just swallow anything that comes along. You're able to chew on it. What does that tell you? Meditation. So the Lord looks at you and the Lord says, you know, your, even your teeth is beautiful. I love the way you meditate on my word. And every time you meditate, the washing is going on. And your teeth come out from the washing. It's like you're whitening your spiritual teeth. You know, it's like every time, because the Bible is the washing of water of the word. Do you know tonight because you came here, you're going to walk out of this place washed. Now, all of us are washed by the blood if we have put our trust in Christ. But there's a washing of the water of the word that washes away the dust and the negativism of this world and all the defilements of this world. That's going to happen to you. Jesus says, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Okay? So that, that is uh, um, the washing of the teeth. Verse 3, now we come to lips. Your lips are like a strand of scarlet and your mouth is lovely. Scarlet is red. Red. Why red? It's a picture of the blood of Jesus. In other words, God looks at the believer. It's like when you speak, it's not like the people of the world. They speak with no hope. Yours is like, there's hope. You are ministering redemption. You are ministering grace. You are talking about what Jesus has done. You are talking about what Jesus can do for them. You know, it's amazing how people misquote this portion of Scripture. You know, that when they say, oh, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And it's always depending on, on, on that particular teacher's slant sometimes. So what, what grieves the Holy Spirit? Let's go to uh, uh, Ephesians 4. Do not, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. No statement opens with and. And means it's a continuation of the previous verse. Or the previous verse. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary building up edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Now, that means if you speak... Some people think, oh, you know, if you don't use profanity, all right, that's what it means. No, we are against profanity. That's not what it's saying. It is saying when you speak to your children, when you speak to your spouse, and you speak according to what they deserve and no more, you grieve the Holy Spirit. So when your words impart grace, what does it mean? That means you are speaking as if the per person has arrived. That's what the Lord did with us in the Song of Songs. He's speaking to us like we are mature. He's speaking to us like we are beautiful. He's speaking to us like our eyes are gentle. He speaks to us like we are meditators. Amen? Amen. Go back to, uh, oh man, time, time, racing against time. Okay. Your neck, oh, your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. So where's the temple, people? The temple is this one here. The temple, right? So that's where we think. That's where our thoughts are. And the Lord says, your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. Now, if you know the pomegranate, this is a picture of a pomegranate. When there's harvest, it's the fruit of blessing. Amen. So uh, notice that the liquid there is red. So when the Lord looks at your head, He sees your thoughts. How many know God sees your thoughts? Now, a lot of people are afraid that God sees their thoughts. A lot of people are afraid. Oh no, He sees my thoughts. But then, He says, your thoughts your head, your temple, where your thoughts are, 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 are springing forth from, they are like a piece of pomegranate. Can you see the right part? All those seeds, it has more seeds than any fruit that you know of. That means what? All those seeds are lively. All those seeds are, are, are seeds that you, one of them, just one of them can produce a tree. In other words, your thoughts are creative thoughts. Life-giving thoughts. 
And how about the part where you're afraid the Lord sees your thoughts? Because we all know that our thoughts is not always all together there. That's where the red liquid comes in. I said that's where the red liquid comes in. I said that's where the red... Why do you think that they're both red, the lips and the pomegranate is together? God is telling you it's the same blood. When I see you, I don't see your dirty thoughts. I see your thoughts wash in my blood. Hallelujah! Still to come today. We don't realize our impact on the Lord. That's when you worship the Lord and you mean it from your heart. Of all the people, the Lord says, wow. Stay tuned. Joseph Prince will be right back. You can be saturated with God's love, strength, and healing in a powerful way. Find out how when you receive Joseph's latest three-CD audio series, Living and Powerful, the life-giving benefits of God's Word, as a thank you for your gift of any amount. This series will inspire you to delight in God's Word day and night, bringing you soul nourishment and good success. For a specific gift, we'll send you a special collection that includes Joseph's latest book, Reign in Life, 90 Powerful Inspirations for Extraordinary Breakthroughs. Whatever challenge you may be going through today, I believe that this book will fill you with faith in Jesus and power you up to reign in life. Request this and other exciting resources today. God wants you to experience the power of His Word. To order these resources, call us toll free at 1-877-769-5433 or visit us at josephprince.org today. Why do you think that they're both red, the lips and the pomegranate is together? God is telling you it's the same blood. When I see you, I don't see your dirty thoughts. I see your thoughts wash in my blood. Hallelujah! Amen! I see your thoughts wash. The bad thought you had just now, already washed. Now you're in chapter 4, right? right you just read how he describes the, the, the bride, right? Chapter 5 is where she rebelled. Okay? And chapter 6, let's see how the Lord treats her after she found the Lord again. Or the Lord found her, rather. You know how the Lord treats her? Chapter 6, Oh my love, you are as beautiful as Tirza. Lovely as Jerusalem. Awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me. They have overcome me. One look from you. And baby, one look from you kept me in my sea. Okay, never mind. It's like one look from you and the Lord says He's overcome. Can you imagine we can overcome the Lord by looking at Him? That's love, man. People receive this. This is the Word of God. I'm not teaching some man's book. I'm teaching the God-breathed, God-inspired book. And look at this. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Gilead. Sounds familiar? He has not changed his view even though she has rebelled in chapter 5. This is chapter 6, by the way. Chapter 4, he describes her. In chapter 5, she rebelled. All right? Does that change his love? Next verse. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep which have come from washing. Is this familiar? We saw this in, in chapter 4. Then chapter 5, she rebelled. He still says the same thing of her. This is for all of you who think God changes his attitude because you have done something wrong, something you should have done. I'm telling you, he still sees you the same. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Chapter 4, okay. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle which feed among the lilies. Now, the imagery is from the times they, they are at, but I'm going to show you uh, fawns, gazelle, twins together. You see the, the beauty of these two fawns, this gazelle? It's beautiful. It speaks of grace. It speaks of beauty. So what is, what is breast in spiritual truth, in spiritual substance? Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. We, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. By the way, some people, like the Bible does say in some of songs that there was a little uh, sister that this woman had. She has no favor because she has no breast. It tells you literally that she has not grown. In other words, there's no faith. The Lord doesn't see love. Here, the typology is in substance, breastplate of faith and love. God wants your faith and love to grow. 
Amen. And, and, and how does faith come? By hearing the word of Christ. How does love come? By seeing him, enjoying his love. We love because he first loved us. Back to song of songs again. The last part says what? The gazelle twins feed among the lilies. And it's talking about the church. It's where God is feeding his people. It's not lily, it is plural, lilies. Where we gather, the Lord is feeding. And that's where your faith and love will grow. Are you with me? And then it says, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I go my way to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. Because of time, I'm not going to expound on that. All right, you are all beautiful, my love, and there is no spot in you. Look at verse uh, 8. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Sener and Hermon, from the lion's dance, from the mountains of the leopards. You have ravished my heart. The Lord is talking to you, you know. You have ravished my heart. Imagine Jesus talking to us like that. You have ravished my heart. Memorize that. Your wife is not here. Use it on your wife. You have ravished my heart. Pia. Okay. What did you say? You know, I'm just, no, she won't do that. She will. Ah, oh, man, I'm telling you. My sister, my spouse. How many, how many know that Jesus is our elder brother? Firstborn. And we are still his spouse. So it's very, very telling. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, with one link of your necklace. It's so beautiful. It's like the Lord is saying, don't you know how you thrill my heart? The moment you, you, you just move and look at me, one look, my heart is captured. More than that. Ravished. Ravish is that we don't realize our impact on the Lord. That's why when you worship the Lord and you mean it from your heart, of all the people, the Lord says, wow, you understand people. Necklace, when you move your neck, your necklace move. With one move of your eyes, one move of your necklace, just to turn to the Lord, the Lord says, you ravish my heart. Amen. All right, we'll finish at 11. Go, drop down. There's so much more to share. How fast your love, my sister, my spouse, how much better than wine is your love? How much better than wine is your love? The Lord is saying, how much better than wine is your love? The word wine here is yayin. And yayin, my friend, is not one quarter water, three quarter wine. Some people say that. It's not yayin. The first mention of yayin is that Noah drank yayin and he was intoxicated. All right? In other words, yayin is, is wine that's fermented, that is alcoholic. All right? God is against drunkenness. He that have ears to hear, let him hear. Don't argue with me, okay, people? All right? I just want to let you know that the Bible says that the Lord likened it. Your love is better than wine. He won't liken it to something bad for illustration. It might be something good, but your love is better than wine. All right? And the scent of your perfumes and all spices. Your lips, oh my spouse, drip as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The Lord is still talking. Honey and milk. He brings us to a land flowing with milk and honey. God is saying, hey, don't you know the promised land is under your tongue. When you speak, you enjoy the promised land. Tell me your love. I'm telling you I love you. There's no spot in you. Amen? And the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. And let me just uh, finish off with this. Drop back to uh, come with me. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Senir and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountain leopards. Now, back then... Lebanon is a very beautiful place. I'm going to close with this. Lebanon is a very, very beautiful place. That's where you get the cedars of Lebanon. When Solomon wrote this, Solomon was enraptured with the beauty of Lebanon. So Lebanon, Hermon, the mountain there, Amana, Senir are all the ranges of Mount Hermon, which is still there today. And it's snow peak. Many of us go there. We see Mount Hermon. It's beautiful. Still beautiful. But watch this. These are pictures of the world with all its attractive allurements. The lion's dens are there. It's a mountain of the leopards. And what do lions go for? Sheep. Leopards also. So the Lord says, watch out when you're in the world. And I'm going to tell you how he attracts us, how he, he uh, purges us, how he brings us away from the world. Watch this. Come with me. When he sees danger, we don't see danger. We think that the world is all right. But the world... This mountain range has the leopards crawling there, all right, crouching there, waiting to kill. They have the lion's dens. Amen? It's a dangerous place. But you know how the Lord attracts us from all this? Come with me. Come with me. Now, people note, he does not say, 
Go away from these places. Go away from the, from the Hermans and the area of Shaner and all that. It's dangerous. There's lions then. Go away. Depart you. Depart. He didn't say go away. Depart. Because you know why? When you say go away and depart, I am here. You are there. It's still not personal. He said like this. Come with me. It's his presence. The way he attracts you from the world is like this. His own presence. He says, come with me. Let me illustrate. Let's say you have a boy and you are playing with a boy in the garden. All right, it's a public garden. But all of a sudden, you didn't realize he was playing and he was playing close to the edge of a precipice. Okay? And you, you are quite a distance away and your, your little boy is playing and all of a sudden, you realize he's near the precipice. What do you do? Say, don't look down. Don't fall. Chances are they will look. A wise parent will say, Justin, over here, Justin, what's this? What's this? He likes Thomas the train. Thomas is, come here. And, okay, and then you, you distract him away from the danger, he will go over here. Not saying, don't, don't, don't. He's saying, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come with me. Come. You get it? He's not saying, depart you, go away from that place. He didn't say, like from a distance, you go away from that place. It's dangerous for you. No. The way he does it, come with me. The law is all about, don't come near, lest you die. Grace is all about, come. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What's the word to all sinners, heavy laden with trying to please God and never, never, never feeling like you, you, you have made it, burdened with guilt, sin, condemnation. Jesus says, come. Come to what? To me. Not to a teaching. To me. And I will give you rest. In fact, the Greek doesn't, doesn't actually say, I will give you. It says literally, you can check this out. I will rest you. Come unto me and I the person will rest you. Thank you for tuning in to our broadcast. You have watched highlights of a sermon by Joseph Prince. To order a copy of the full